So, uh, what I've come to be very interested in is how we think about um, management and organization. So, for me, the emphasis is on how we think and how we think about how we're thinking. So, it becomes a kind of double recursive loop and a reflexive uh, kind of activity. There. Be engaging. And um, some people don't altogether understand why there should be such an emphasis on thinking. In fact, I remember a few years ago uh, taking an MBA class when I was going on about how we think about organizations. And one very intelligent uh, chap said, Why are you making all this fuss about thinking? And I was, uh, uh, I'm not often completely lost for words, but I was then, because I thought, is it a university? And he's asking, why are we making a fuss about thinking? Very surprising that we should do that. And uh, to put into some kind of perspective, why is it important uh, to pay attention to how we're thinking? Um, I'd like to introduce an idea that comes from a natural scientist and epidemiologist called Ludwig Fleck, who published the book in about 1936, I think it was. And the title of the book I found very intriguing because the title is uh, the origin and evolution of a scientific fact. And of course I was intrigued by that because uh, even though it was only a few years ago okay, that I was given this book by a former student, uh, I, I was still under the impression that a fact was a fact. There it is, it's a fact. It doesn't have an origin and it doesn't involve, evolve because it is. And uh, he's got, uh, developed in this book uh, uh, an idea, ideas that draw on his own experience as an epidemiologist. And he was particularly worked in the area, one of the areas he worked in was uh, the disease of syphilis. So he takes syphilis as his case study throughout the book to show how, uh, although the uh, particulars of the disease haven't changed over the centuries, how we, what, how we think about it, what it means, has changed an awful lot. So if you go back hundreds of years, uh, what was the cause of the disease? Well, it's your bad behavior and your wicked sinfulness uh, for which God is punishing you. And gradually over the uh, centuries, it's evolved to what is now understood to be the scientific fact, which is that it's caused by uh, a virus or whatever um, that isn't a punishment. Uh, it's... Uh, and it can be cured by a penicillin shot, whereas before you'd have it once you uh, encountered this thing. So this was his kind of idea that um, how we understand something has origins and it doesn't evolve. And uh, in order to explain this, he introduced uh, the idea of what he called thought collectives. And that's groupings of people who are engaged in thinking about a particular phenomenon. And all scientists and everybody else, all of us, are members of thought collectives. And the distinguishing feature of thought collective is that it has a thought style, a particular way of thinking 
that is policed by the group. And if you start questioning it, you face a very real threat of being excluded from, uh, from that group. So you end up uh, thinking in a particular way without even being aware that it is a particular way. Uh, and that there's nothing immutable about it. Um, and it. It just never occurs to you because you're a member of this thought collective. So um, I think that's what I've been very greatly interested in. What, how, how, does, uh, how, how does our thinking evolve? Um, and I think it evolves by moving finding yourself moving from one sort of collective to another. As, as you grow older, you encounter different groupings of people who got different ways of thinking, and in order to be included, you find yourself thinking in those particular ways. So if I look back on uh, my life, uh, my uh, graduate education, uh, was mainly in economics, and uh, I first studied in Johannesburg, South Africa for undergraduate, and then came to London to the London School of Economics, where uh, I studied a lot of mathematical economics and econometrics and <coughs> statistics and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> <coughs> So I found myself, without being aware of it, being a, a member of a thought collective which was positivist economists. And by that I mean uh, taking for granted view that the world, all, all of the world, moved according to fixed laws, rather like the planets, so economies also moved according to fixed laws, so that if you did this, then that would happen. And it was the task of the economist as scientists to identify what these laws were, so that we could in advance predict the consequences of following policy A rather than policy B, and so make a rational decision about uh, which of these uh, courses of action uh, followed. And it never occurred to me to uh, uh, think about that or challenge that. That's how it was. Uh, and nobody around me was thinking about it or challenging it uh, in, in the immediate circle. There were other economists, for example, the Austrian economists, who didn't go down this uh, highly positivistic mathematical Root, uh, one of which was actually the professor I'd had in Johannesburg, uh, Ludwig Lachmann, who, who turned out, I didn't realize at the time, he was actually a very famous economist and he had a big influence on me. But he didn't go down this route. And when I went back there to lecture for a couple of years, I just thought that was because he couldn't do the mathematics. <laughs> Pretty arrogant thing. Uh, I thought that, but I now know he was absolutely right. So, uh, the thing is, I, I left lecturing after a couple of years and ended up working in uh, industry. And um, I encountered a different way of thinking. It wasn't that kind of positivistic. Thing. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like I had a conversion experience or anything. I just gradually dropped all this positivistic stuff because nobody around me was uh, doing it and it didn't help. I discovered all this model building and stuff that I'd been engaged in. Nobody was using it in a, a different world. Uh, so I had to acquire whatever it was needed to operate in that different world. So, in other words, the thought style, my thought style, our thought style, was evolving 
depending upon which groupings of people I, I uh, was engaged in. <clears throat> and then, after some years, I grew the solution with all that uh, kind of experience and landed up at the universe, what became the University of Hertfordshire, but at the time was Hatfield Polytechnic. And the reason I landed up there is because I got to the point where I couldn't think of anything else to do. I wasn't terribly interested in the thing, but I uh, had lots of financial obligations and I had to um, agree some money. So I landed up uh, doing that. And what I was asked to do was to lecture uh, at first to undergraduates about strategic management and to take part in designing uh, the first MBA of the business school, uh, where the call was going to be in sort of strategic management. So uh, then, for the first time, I had to start reading the textbooks on strategic management. While I've been doing it at this large international construction company, I hadn't read anything about the strategic management. I just got involved with everybody around me and we were sort of doing it, but we weren't really. Uh, but we never stopped to think about what were we actually doing. When I read the textbooks, uh, I couldn't um, recognize anything I'd been doing in the textbooks. They were completely unconnected to any uh, experience, any reality that I had encountered in, in the organizations, organizations that I worked with, which creates a bit of a problem if you're now going to teach uh, people, uh, particularly when the MBA began, people who were coming part-time from their day jobs and uh, they're going to have to sit there listening to me talking uh, what I thought was largely nonsense in the textbooks, and I still think that. Um, so what, what was I going to do? And that's when I began to think about, well, what were we actually doing? And that became the basis then of what I was trying to involve uh, students in. And in reviewing what had happened, what I thought I was involved in, one thing really, really puzzled me and really bothered me, which was that uh, all the forecasts we'd ever made as the basis of our strategic plans uh, all turned out to be wrong. So I remember one five-year period we said we were going to do A, B, C, D, and E, and F, uh, and it was going to call, uh, bring us huge profits and a great big cash inflow. And by and large we did all these things, and five years later we were on the verge of collapsing. So instead of all, all the profits and cash flow, uh, the exact opposite happened. So what did we do? We did what is, what is absolutely typical, and we thought we needed to try harder, so we needed to spend more time on all the strategic planning and forecasting and gather more information and do more analysis, uh, and that's what we did. Except uh, I left halfway through the following period uh, for all sorts of reasons. <clears throat> but when I went back to find out what happened, uh, they had done the exact opposite of what the strategic plan called for, and it was a great financial success. <laughs> so that was my huge puzzle. Because with this positivistic education I had, um, I'd taken it for granted, uh, for granted that if we just did enough work and we built good enough models, we would be able to forecast what would happen. And here I had to confront the fact that we never had done. 
but I had no way of explaining why that was the case. All my ways of explaining said it was possible, but my experience said it's not. So how am I going to uh, explain that? Um, and it was important to me to explain that, because otherwise I was never sure of what on earth I was doing. I had, didn't have confidence in, in, in what, what I was doing. And it was then by chance that I came across a book uh, by a man called Blick, an American, and it was called Chaos, The Emergence of a New Science. And I was actually looking for a novel, I remember. I'd been writing the first book I ever wrote, and I was fed up with the whole thing. I just wanted to get away from it and read a novel. And then I saw this book, and it was chaos, the emergence of a new science. I thought, I've never heard about this. I don't know what this is about. Maybe I ought to read it. And uh, that was a kind of turning point, because I found it very difficult, despite the fact that I did have a mathematical background, I found it really difficult to follow this thing. But I had a kind of feeling that there was an explanation here for this question that was causing me a lot of concern. And uh, that explanation of first go at it uh, took the form of uh, reading over and over again until I understood the concept of mathematical chaos. Now, it's very unfortunate that the guy who discovered this, Edward Lorenz, a meteorolo meteorologist, uh, called it chaos, because of course, uh, to, mo to the, usually we think of chaos as utter confusion. But in fact, what he was discovering is that in what looked like utter confusion, there was in fact pattern. And the pattern was a paradox. It was regularly irregular. Uh, it was a stable instability or unstable stability. It doesn't matter which way around you go. And bubble, in terms of my question, it was predictable unpredictability. So, uh, what then, uh, uh, why, why is that so? Well, um, to really understand that, you need to go back a little bit to uh, the nature of model building. All of natural science is based upon building mathematical models. And the mathematical models that uh, are used in traditional science are all linear. So that Newton and Leibniz, who invented mathematical calculus, knew that the world was non-linear. The problem with trying to build a non-linear model is you can't solve the equations. Uh, for some of them, you can make probabilistic predictions, but for most, you can't. And natural scientists of the more traditional kind were uh, all positivist, and that wasn't good enough. You had to be able to predict properly uh, what, would, uh, what would happen. So the calculus takes nonlinear relationships and linearizes them. And then we've got a linear model and we can make predictions. And for some phenomena, it works fantastically. So Newton was able to uh, provide us with laws of gravity and celestial motion uh, that still uh, are very useful, even though there are slight imprecisions in, in them. But when you, you, you move to a non-linear model, you can't really predict. But if you have enormous computer power, you can simulate nonlinear models. So, with the advent of computers in the 50s and by the early 60s, um, it, it, 
became possible to explore nonlinear models, and that's what Edward Lorenz was doing. He had a very simple three equation model of uh, the Weber system, and he ran that on this enormous computer, I think he was at, at, at MIT, uh, to see what it would do. So you have to give up predicting, but you can get some insight into the dynamics, which means patterns of movement or patterns in space. And that's uh, what he was doing. When he discovered that in certain conditions, non-linear relationships have the property of escalating tiny changes into unpredictable patterns, outcomes. And uh, he gave this the technical term of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, but it's easier to know it in its popular form as the butterfly effect, which I'm sure most people would have heard of. And this is a kind of the butterfly effect, it's a kind of mind game in which you uh, understand that if a butterfly flaps its wings in Sao Paulo, Brazil, it could escalate up into a hurricane over uh, Miami. So in order to be able to predict that, you would have to be able to trace uh, the movements all the way back to the butterfly with that swings there in Sao Paulo, uh, which is impossible. And furthermore, it's not just up to that one butterfly, it's up to everything else that's moving uh, on the entire planet. So you would have to be able to measure with infinite precision every movement on the entire planet and probably further afield uh, in order to make a long-term prediction. You can still make short-term predictions because it takes time for tiny changes to escalate. So what I found is very exciting because it's pretty clear to me that uh, interactions between human beings are non-linear. Uh, I can't predict what impact I'm going to have on people. Uh, usually, I sort of know because I know them, they know me, and by and large, we get along okay. Uh, but every now and again, something erupts, uh, and uh, I've said the wrong thing, and everybody's getting annoyed, and uh, uh, we're having to deal with that, and I wasn't able to predict this, and I'm not able to predict how we're going to deal with what I have just provoked, but not on my own, uh, because the others are responding in a way that's also provoking me. And none of us quite know um, where this is going to take us. So for me, human interaction uh, has this property which metaphorically is akin to <clears throat> mathematical chaos. And for me, that had profound implications because I can now understand <coughs> why we kept getting our forecasts wrong. We got them wrong because it's impossible to forecast much in the first place. So why are we bothering? Uh, because people are still doing it. And if we can't forecast, and if I can't say following policy A will be better than following policy B, if I can't say what the outcome of my next action is going to be, um, then what's the point of strategic planning? Why do we prepare these plans that are supposed to take us through <coughs> five years? Uh, we're still doing it, supposedly. Uh, so why are we doing it? What, what's, what's it all about? So that was for me the first insight 
that got me uh, writing um, to explain to myself this difficult thing. And it was psychologically difficult, because if you believe the world is uh, controllable, uh, it's predictable, it means it's controllable. And if you abandon this predictability business, it means you're not in control. And in fact, no one else is either. So it's a fantasy to think them up at the top know what they're doing. And they're um, in control. <coughs> may I interrupt you? Yeah. Uh, okay. There is some thing that, which takes my attention away from what you're saying. I find it a little bit cool this idea. And if I'm thinking so, maybe others do too. So okay, we'll shut the door. Yeah, yeah. good, thank you. Am I the only one? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so it makes it easier to focus. Now I can feel the breeze on my back, but I'm just talking. Yeah, I, know, I, know. I wasn't paying any attention. Thank you. Okay, no, no, that's fine. So, any, any, anyway, it's a good place to stop to get uh, some kind of response from you about uh, what, what, what I'm saying. So, uh, okay, uh, I'll ask, I'll ask you another question. <laughs> when you think about the fact that we're not in control, actually there isn't anyone out there who's in control, we don't really know what's going to happen, uh, how do you feel about that? What kind of feeling you stop? Explorative. Explore you. Uh -huh. I can say anything, so let's just try it. Okay. Uh, but don't you dare to do that. Yeah, well, that, that's the point, isn't it? You can't just say anything. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Uh, uh, it means to explore, but that's not easy. It's not easy to say anything. And if you say anything, you'll very rapidly get into a lot of trouble. So. Uh, there's something interesting to explore in that. Uh, but how can I explore? What can I say uh, in human? Yeah. My, my answer to your question would be uh, kind of paradoxical to me, being a bit scared but also excited. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know what will happen. Yeah, yeah. But it, and that is kind of interesting and exciting as well. Yeah. Mm. So same here. I have the same feeling. It's sort of uh, strong with the words, but on the one hand, liberated, and on the other hand, restricted. Somehow, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. At this precise moment, phlegmatic, because I travelled here this morning on a train network that should run to a timetable and should be predictable and ordered, and it was it was completely chaotic. So, at some point, I was not I was struck by the irony of that uh, to where I was coming, and then at some moment in time, felt the anxiety rising because I was going to be late, and then thought, you know what, you're just going to have to to go with it, and you'll arrive when you arrive. So, um, <clears throat> one of the things that then comes up for me about that <clears throat> is that although um, I'm, what I'm doing is emphasizing the unpredictability of life, uh, at the same time, and this is what makes it uh, paradoxical, I, um, it is also predictable. So, at the moment, there's a lot of chaos on the railways, but usually, by and large, uh, it sort of works well enough. So when I took the Catholic Express, it left on time, it got here on time, the cab ride took exactly what I would expect it to take, and in fact the whole day went by clockwork, which is mostly what happens. But then every now and again, it doesn't. 
and you don't know what's going to happen then. And uh, I think being able to recognize that and say, well, I'm just going to have to put up with it. I'll be late. I'll be late. Can I say something? Because I think what's interesting about that is when you describe, then I felt my anxiety level increasing. Because the thing is that when people expect us to be able to work in predictable ways, and we re and re and realize we can't, that whole question about responsibility and accountability comes up, which is the reason why this kind of paradoxical thing about is liberating on the one hand, but kind of restraining at the other, because people have expectations towards us about being able to predict. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole paradigm constraining us because people expect us to be able to do yeah, that. Yeah. And we feel responsible in some way mm -hmm. to respond to that expectation. I think there's something about the highly interdependent nature of advanced societies as well. If you think about how much improvisational work goes into getting the trains to run on time. It's not something that happens by itself. It's drivers have to turn up to work on time. They have to leave on time, they have to be guards, nobody needs to throw themselves on the, on the line. All kinds of ensemble performances are going on all the time in order to make that regularity work. So even though it's regular and reasonably predictable, it's made so by the activity of lots of people working together and coordinating. And also, I liked your point about uh, there's something uh, exciting about it as well, because if you can't know what's going to happen, it opens up opportunities of trying your idea of exploration. It means trying this and trying that. And also, if you start thinking about it, uh, would you really want your life to be predictable? And uh, I'm pretty sure I don't, my life has not been predictable, and I don't want it to be predictable uh, even now. Uh, because, if, uh, for example, if you uh, knew you were going to die of a heart attack at 2.30 on <laughs> the 3rd of June uh, 2020, how the hell would you uh, get through <laughs> um, the, the, the rest of the time up until that point would be terrible. So I'm very glad, uh, I know I'll die, but I'm very glad I don't know when or how. Um, so I, I think we, we have come in <clears throat> modern society to attach too much importance to things being controllable and predictable, and we've lost this improvisational nature of our uh, experience, and we haven't lost it, we're still doing it, but we don't pay any attention to it, we don't think about it, and I guess that's what, when you are able to, uh, to accept that life is not, it is predictable, but it's also not, uh, then uh, you start paying attention to different things, which is what I think is, is, is important. So another question then, uh, <clears throat> if you can't predict uh, what will happen if you do this rather than that together, uh, what's the point of all the strategic planning and stuff? What's the point of... I think it will build a tribe. Sorry? It will build, build a tribe. The people do agree together that it is very important to do all this stuff. So they stick together and they have the feeling of a shared identity. And I think that's very nice for a human being to have a shared identity. Right. right. Yeah. It, we need to get stuff done. So, you know, we, we need to work together to get stuff done, so we have to have a go, let's say, let's do it like this, you know, let's, perhaps we wouldn't create a five-year strategy, but we might say, let's go in this direction. Mm -hmm. I think that might also economize our mental energy, because we, uh, what we need to do in, to, in order to focus is sometimes to uh, have some things being predictable, then I can 
sort of canalize my interest in, on, in a bunch of other things. So, for instance, I don't think about riding my bike anymore, I just do. And if I had to think about that, then I would spend too much energy. And I think maybe the planning part is the same. If I made a plan and I can put something aside and say that's going to go ahead for me, then I don't have to spend too much energy on that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> there could be different ways of thinking about what you both be saying. So that I would think riding a bicycle is um, a kind of practical skill that you require, you've acquired. It doesn't require a plan. It's, it's uh, as you say, if you thought about it, you'd probably fall off. But because you've done it a lot, you've got the practical skill yeah. of being able to do it. Exactly. Uh, without thinking about it. But I think what you're in the planning is trying to put strategic action into the same kind of activity as riding bike. So if I've made a plan, then I can uh, go about my strategic activities in the same way as riding bike. It doesn't require much energy. Well, I think there's a That's big problem with that. Yeah? That, that, go uh, ahead. Um, <laughs> and it's, if you take unpredictability seriously, mm -hmm. then what's the point? So, for example, if I go Back to my experience in this international construction company where I became the manager of corporate strategy and all that kind of stuff. And I really think, well, what did we actually do? Well, when we prepared the five year plan, which happened every November, uh, I was the only person in a department of eight to 15 people who had anything to do with the strategic plan. Uh, because it was a secret. So um, uh, we didn't want our competitors to know what we were doing. So I would put the plan together and uh, I would do so by having discussions with the managing directors of all our subsidiary companies. And uh, they found it a bit of a bore uh, to do this. And when I'd ask, well, what kind of do you think it's going to happen? They, they'd make up stuff about, oh, well, we'll probably get a contract in Saudi Arabia, and we'll, we'll maybe enter the market in Venezuela, and uh, maybe we'll do housing in the United States. So they'd invent all this stuff and put some numbers on it and I'd put the whole thing together and write it up for the chief executive. And I would, uh, I've stopped doing this after a while. I would uh, say we shouldn't accept the uh, strategic plan of this building products company that we've got because it's unrealistic and it's unlikely the market will move in that way. And the chief executive would always say, no, we're not going to um, deal with that now. It will cause a lot of trouble with uh, uh, political trouble with the managing directors. We'll approve everything subject to submissions for investment approval, and then we'll deal with any difficulties one by one as they crop up. So the strategic plan was always just approved. <clears throat> it was secret, so it had to be filed in a locked drawer. I got in trouble once because I left it on my, my desk, and there wasn't anything in it that um, really would have benefited any competitor at all. And I did say in, uh, after a bit, well, look, if this is a secret and nobody else in the company, apart from the board of directors, knows what it's about, how's it ever going to happen? So they did move into the point of, uh, of circulating uh, a summarized, vague sort of um, message about uh, what the thing was. And then what happened? We forgot about the whole thing, and we got on with doing whatever it was we were doing, and that's what got me really thinking, so what was it we were doing? Preparing and approving the plan took about six weeks, so what on earth was I doing the rest of the year and what were these 8 to 15 people 
who worked in the uh, corporate planning department, what, what on earth were they doing all the end? What, what is everybody else doing when we've locked this thing up in a cupboard and by the end of the year, nobody could remember what it had said? And so I'd sometimes summarize, and sometimes I didn't, what, uh, what we'd, we'd said we were going to do. So, uh, uh, and I, I discovered afterwards, when I started doing quite a lot of consulting work in the field of strategic planning and writing plans for other companies, that the same thing happened. So, what, why were we doing it? Why are people still doing it? That became uh, the question. Yeah, I think uh, there are multiple reasons, but I think one thing we gained probably is some sense of control. Some, you know, it makes us feel comfortable, confident, good about the future. And from being here now and thinking about the future. I also think it builds some kind of common language if we do it together. And maybe also some ideas of, you know, I understand what you want and you understand what I want. And so, so it kind of creates an awareness of what it seems like we, we all want at this, at this kind of state. Mm -hmm. But of course it's, it's also delusion. Yes. Absolutely, because it's it's only based on <coughs> us here and now, and not what we actually, you know, what, what we actually have. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so quite unaware. Having uh, anxiety since we don't know what will happen. So how can we handle all of those feelings together in between to have that? I think that what you're both getting at is the, what I came to feel, because I was puzzled by this. I thought, what are we doing? What, what, why, are we, why am I still doing this when, in, in consulting jobs? And I happened to, by chance again, have become fairly involved with the Tavistock Institute that uh, takes a very psychoanalytic attitude towards uh, thinking about organizations. And of course, they're, uh, they're, one of their big things is anxiety. So I was kind of tuned into this, uh, everything's anxiety provoking. And, uh, and a lot of things are, including uh, if, if, if you were to walk around all day long thinking, I don't know what's going to happen, I'm not in control, nobody's in control, what on earth is going to happen, you wouldn't function. Uh, you'd be so riven with anxiety that you wouldn't be able to do anything. So uh, we human beings do have to have defences against anxiety. Most of the time I don't think about uh, not being in control or not being able to predict or whatever. Only occasionally, like now, when I sit down, then, then I might talk about it and think about it. But not normally, I don't. And most people don't either. And they still become ill. And then, of course, they do. So we need defenses against anxiety. And there are all kinds of ways in which we can defend ourselves against anxiety by denying things, uh, by uh, delusions or illusions of uh, being in control when we're not. Um, and I, I think, therefore, uh, and one member of this uh, institute in psychiatry, uh, psychoanalyst called Elizabeth uh, Mamies, uh, she wrote about social defences against anxiety. But these are collective defences that we evolved between us to help protect all of us from exposure to anxiety. And I think uh, that becomes, for me, a very important way of thinking about organisational life. 
that um, we engage in a lot of the processes and procedures of, of organizational life because they're defenses against anxiety. And that doesn't mean it's stupid or it's silly or, or weak or any, it's just perfectly normal that we should do them. So we go through procedures like um, strategic planning because it does make us feel a bit more secure. And, and as you said, but we have these discussions, and the board approves it and all that, uh, and therefore we think we're all agreeing. In fact, we don't. So we, we give it a rubber stamp it and say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're all on the same page, and we're not. But, but we're covering over the fact that we're not uh, by having this document. And it's the same with almost most organizational procedures. So as we discover, we can't forecast, which uh, the 1970s, when, which is when I was working with a construction company, with uh, oil price explosions and power failures and um, strikes and God knows what all was a, a completely tumultuous uh, period where you, know, you couldn't forecast anything. And I think a response to that appeared by the middle 80s, 1980s, in which people started talking about having visions and missions and charismatic leaders and of course, all of that is religious. It comes from religion, and it's spread like wildfire through the world, and it still um, dominates uh, our, our thinking. What's your vision? Uh, and, and for me, it's kind of nonsense. It's all right if you're uh, a devout Roman Catholic to talk about a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is an extraordinary way of seeing something. Uh, I don't have that way of seeing anything, but if some people do, fine. But in an organization, trying to carry out business of some sort, or to teach, or to provide therapy, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, and yet, we carry on doing it. And I think that's a defense against anxiety. So we start uh, talking about values. Uh, friendliness and collegiality and in the meantime what we're actually experiencing is, is a climate of bullying and uh, uh, and the complete lack of collegial collegiality uh, so uh, if, as soon as you start really accepting really accepting uncertainty you start questioning all kinds of stuff um, can I ask a question? Yeah. So what, what is it that we do that is not rooted in some sort of relation to anxiety? Um, so, the, the, uh, probably, well, the, 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 when we're just following social conventions, mm. which we're doing most of the time, yeah. the, the kind of social background that we've all uh, been socialized into, then I don't, uh, uh, with all its defenses and all that kind of thing, then I don't think we feel particularly anxious. But as soon as that gets ruptured by something uncertain happening, then we, we do start experiencing anxiety. And But that's not my question. My question is, what is it that we are doing as humans that are not somehow affected by our underlying Potential anxiety. Is there any? You know, I, I think there are temporarily, um, and and that's because of this uh, idea that we live in a society, we live in relationship to each other, mm -hmm. and those relationships have patterns that are coherent um, uh, and and go by the name of. The, like the, the social background, the life world, 
uh, habitus. So, uh, an habitus is, 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 is the world of habit in which we live. Uh, and uh, we discipline our, our, ourselves and each other by uh, being concerned about what other people will think of us. Uh, and the pragmatist philosopher George Herbert Mead talked, talked about this as taking the attitude of the other. And uh, you can see how that's a perfectly practical idea because I, I, mean, I, I always use this example. I can still remember how awful I felt when my mother said to me as a little boy, Ralph, if you do things like that, what do people think of you? And it felt awful. Uh, oh my God, what, what will they, they think of me? And of course, what, the fear is you will be excluded. And none of us can live all our, on our own. Uh, we need each other. We need other people. And therefore, we have to behave in a disciplined way according to the habitus. Uh, and that's how we know what to do. So there's a habitus now. We, we don't have to work out or plan how, how are we going to behave in a workshop like this. We already know that certain things you do and certain things you don't do. And while we're doing that, I don't think we're feeling anxious. But as soon as it, something a bit different starts happening, then, then we fall back on our defense of like denial or uh, a fantasy or elaboration or all, all kinds of different ways we've had. But as soon as you start thinking about organization of life in that way, you are now able to start understanding why people are doing very strange things um, why they're suddenly uh, being very aggressive to you or, and to each other. Uh, the first question I would ask is, so what's, what's the anxiety here? Uh, and if you can begin to understand that, you can develop greater options for how you might respond to uh, what, what's going on in, in particular groups? I have a um, couple of thoughts I wanted to share on that. first one is to, to your point about um, are we always anxious in the face of uncertainty? Um, in, the, in the work that we do, we, we talk about bounded and unbounded uncertainty. So, for an example, there's uncertainty associated with how a book might turn out or what's going to happen in a film or watching a game of football. These are all bounded uncertainty. The game ends at some point. And there's very little consequence personally associated with the uncertainty. And so I enjoy that. Um, that I experience it excite as excitement rather than anxiety, even though there's uncertainty there. Um, and then you, when you, you go, okay, not all uncertainty provokes anxiety, then you can see that in organisation life. And often it's associated with low risk things. So if you were implementing a change in an organisation and the change, um, whether through denial or otherwise, I feel it doesn't affect me. I'm going, well, okay, we're rebranding. I'm going to get a new T-shirt and a mug with a new brand on it. I'm loving that uncertainty. Um, but if it then attaches itself to consequence, I might lose position or a client or whatever. Then my anxiety goes up. Um, and the second thought, um, Ralph, you were talking about um, social defences against anxiety. Um, when we work with leadership teams, we've we compile a, a list of 16 or 17 things that groups typically engage in to reduce the anxiety associated with um, anything from conflict to uncertain conversation. And they're very good at it. We, we've seen this in action, this social defence against anxiety. Very good at it. Um, everything from inappropriate humour through to um, talking, shifting the discussion out of the room and talking about them over there instead of us in the room. All, all specifically targeted at combating and reducing that anxiety very quickly. Um, it's, I find this kind of a bit of a counterpoint. Okay, I, I guess I would, uh, my kind of response to what you're saying is um, 
On the occasions where, you, where you, there's some change announced that involve you getting a t-shirt in the mug, I don't think that's uncertainty at all. I think that's a big cover over of, uh, uh, of what's going on, and that that's a sign of defense against anxiety. So I'm saying that as a kind of implication that, that it quite, uh, to think more about uh, what it is we're engaged in and not have the tendency to too fast distinguishing this one from that one. So for me the distinction isn't between bounded and unbounded uh, uncertainty because uncertainty is just uncertainty. It means uh, you don't know. Where, where you can draw a distinction, I think, uh, is between risk and uncertainty. And the economist in the 1930s, uh, Nart, um, he wrote a whole book on the distinction. So risk is something that happens over and over again. Uh, it's repetitive. People are dying all the time at, at different ages. So you can draw up tables which say your risk of dying at uh, the age of 30 is point this, and at 70 is much higher point that. And on that basis, you can take out a life insurance policy. So the whole insurance industry works with managing risk. You can manage risk if it's highly repetitive events. Uncertainty relates to unique events. There is no probability. It either happens or it doesn't. And you can't know in advance whether it will happen or whether it won't. Uh, and, yeah, that's your way of thinking about it. It's perfectly fine. All I'm suggesting is you could take it further. That kind of uh, idea. But I guess that story reminds me of changing not a t-shirt and a cup, but a collar and a name. And I guess some people would describe it just like you are. Well, we're just changing our name and our changing from orange to blue. For me, it meant quite a lot. So I guess it also comes down to thinking that we know whether it's, it's kind of a small sense of uncertainty and a small risk or threat to identity or a big one. It may be kind of different for different people involved in that kind of situation. But it's interesting if the manager, for instance, I would say, well, this is not really a big change. We'll just continue to do all the same stuff, but actually, other people may feel that it's a huge change to some extent. So I think the idea of being able to identify whether it's one or the other, it can become problematic. Unless it's individual. Because I agree with you, it's entirely contextual for each person that's experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to move on from that. There's only a limited amount of that. So, where does that leave us then? Uh, where did that leave me? Um, I was very interested in all this stuff about uncertainty, and for me, it began to turn everything on its head uh, around thinking about organizational life and management and leadership. But if that's all, then. Uh, doesn't really take us all that far and it could be quite disturbing. So if life isn't happening according to our plans and our plans are actually defences against anxiety or ploys in the political process where uh, if you want money from uh, your organisation you can't say uh, turn up to the finance director and say, look, I've been around for a while, I'm good at what I do, just trust me and hand me a few million. Uh, that won't happen. So what you have to do is you have to build the business case. So you invent this whole stuff that sounds terribly rational and you take that to the decision, supposed decision makers, who also know that um, they don't know what's going to happen, but it becomes the game, the political game in which we use this 
rational sounding stuff in order to justify taking the next move. And they're perfectly legitimate. They become rhetorical ploy. But um, that's partly how things are actually happening. But what else? How, how does it come about that despite the fact that we can't forecast, on the whole, uh, we do get a lot of stuff done. And on the whole, it's pretty coherent and orderly a, a lot of the time. And when it all breaks down, we scramble around and uh, manage to put it back together again and carry on. Uh, so what are we doing when we do that? Um, so I want to then just go on to say that the, the book I wrote when I was so enthused about all this mathematical chaos, I thought I was writing a journal paper, but it grew longer and longer, and it became a book called The Chaos Frontier, which manuscript of that grew longer and longer because the people who were reading it and critiquing it didn't seem to get the point. And I became more and more strident about, uh, about what it was I, I was trying to say. And I claimed in that book that organizations were chaotic systems. And then I got invited to uh, go and do various bits and pieces in the, in the US uh, and, in, and to join a society called the Chaos Society. And at a meeting of that uh, society, with all these other weird folk interested in chaos, well, as I was, uh, I discovered there was something called complexity, complexity sciences. What's that all about? So I started reading that, and I thought, oh dear, um, I've made a real mistake. Um, organizations aren't chaotic systems. They're complex systems. So I then wrote, a few years later, another book, which was published in 1996, called Complexity and Creativity in Organizations, in which I claimed that they were, um, organizations were complex systems. And then through uh, one thing and another, uh, after 2000, um, with my colleagues, particularly at that time, Doug Griffin and Patricia Shaw, uh, we started saying, well, actually, organizations aren't systems at all, and it isn't in the slightest helpful to talk about them or think about them as if they were systems. So, <clears throat> what were they then? What are they? Well, it didn't mean completely abandoning uh, the insights of the complexity <laughs> science. So, the, what, uh, 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 there's a particular branch of the complexity sciences that I found very intriguing, and that models, mathematical models again, uh, called complex adapted systems. Now, these non-linear models differ from traditional scientific models in that they are not attempting to model the whole. So normally you would have equations that are uh, modeling some whole, even if the whole is just an atom. Uh, but what complex adaptive systems do is that they're agent-based models. So, um, instead of saying anything about the whole in advance, they simply specify, start off specifying the nature of the agent. And the agents, the key thing about them is they interact with each other. So in the models, the, the agents are little computer programs. Uh, there might be only three instructions but there are instructions about how to interact with neighboring uh, agents. And what these models show is that uh, this 
local interaction between these little agents produces global coherence. So, this local interaction, the technical term for it, is self-organization. I have stopped using self-organization because people interpreted that uh, to mean uh, self-management. They uh, thought it meant anybody could do anything they liked, when it means the exact opposite. Um, they started writing about it as if it was some force of nature that could be unleashed and controlled, um, which it can't. It isn't the force of nature. It's simply a technical term that means local interaction. And local interaction produces emergent population-wide coherence. So, uh, just to give you a quick example, the example I usually use uh, is the, uh, the human brain. And some neuroscientists have been using complex adaptive system models to model the, the human brain. So, in, in that kind of thinking, the brain uh, consists of billions of agents, each, each agent being a neuron, a little cell, and uh, each little cell is connected to a limited number of other little cells. And what are they doing? They're firing electrochemical energy all the time. But in particular sequences, particular ways. So if you were to be able to isolate a neuron A and watch what it was doing, you'd find it's uh, connected to uh, A, B, C, uh, X, Y, Z. And when it fires, it triggers A, B, C, who then fire, and they have two are connected up to others, and when they fire, others fire. But at the same time, A is firing A, B, and C, it's inhibiting X, Y, and Z from firing. And A, of course, in turn, is being triggered by yet other neurons. And in that sense, it's local, not be because they're next to each other, but because they're connected to each other. But the connection numbers of, numbers of connections are highly limited. And it's local in another sense. And the sense is that how did they come to be connected in that way, that particular way? Well, through uh, life experience. So when you're born, uh, only 20% of ne neurons are connected up. Usually, uh, or always, the base of the spine, the biologically, evolutionarily oldest part of the head, the top of the spine, which has a lot to do with emotion and uh, reflex actions like sucking which obviously you have to be born able to do, otherwise you won't survive. Uh, but the rest of it, 80% of it, isn't connected at all. And the experience of life, of being nurtured, in the conversation of gestures with the caregiver, is that connections begin to form. And as you repeatedly encounter a similar experience, the strength of the connections grows. And throughout life, uh, the connections are forming and being broken apart. And there's very persuasive research which shows that as an infant, uh, the numbers of connections and the strength of the connections you form depend upon how stimulating and nurturing your environment is. So if you're deprived, you've had, had it for life because you, you're never de developing enough connection. If you're 
fortunate enough to be in a family which is stimulating and nurturing, uh, then you're forming loads of uh, connections which are going to stand you in good stead as, as you go through, if you continue to have stimulating experiences. Until, of course, you become very old when the numbers of connections and structures begin to exceed the numbers of new new connections, which is a pity, but there it is. So, how the whole thing works then depends upon experience. The experience the body is having in the environment was with the, particularly in the relationships with the people, uh, with the relationships with other bodies. And in that sense, it's local interaction going on in the brain, because there isn't any central direction. There isn't uh, managing neurons. There's no committee of senior neurons telling all the other neurons what to do. They're locally interactive, and that local <coughs> interaction produces coherent patterns across the whole population of neurons, which is the brain. It has to be so, otherwise we wouldn't be able to move around and we wouldn't be able to think. <coughs> so for me, that is more revolutionary insight even than the fact that life is not predictable. Because it turns a whole of dominant management thinking on its head. Organize, the patterns of organization in life do not arise because powerful people are choosing them. Powerful people and others are trying to choose them, but because everybody's trying to choose what will happen, and nobody gets what they want. You have to keep compromising, negotiating, um, and that goes... Uh, for the organization called the family as well. As, as I'm sure you all know, no one is in charge of the family unit. Continued political negotiation about even not what kind of meal you're going to have and how you go to a restaurant or not, or um, all, all, all that kind of thing. So it means um, that we need to pay attention the primary attention must be pay, paid to what we are getting up to in our local interaction, uh, in our communication with each other, in our power relations with each other. And we can't, if you start moving to this way of thinking, you cannot evade the fact that we are constantly in relationships of power uh, with each other. And we need to be able to understand that uh, we're constantly engaged in politics. Organizations, the processes of organizations are fundamentally political. And it's an illusion to think that they're happening because of somebody being in control. And, and when you start thinking about it that way, the whole of organizational life starts being an awful lot more amusing and a great deal more interesting and exciting than if you think somebody ought to be in control and they're not doing it properly and uh, all, all that, uh, that kind of stuff. And then there's one more important insight and then we can stop the coffee and come back afterwards into some more groups. And that is, uh, again, if you go back to mathematical modeling, if the agents in a module and model are homogeneous, that, that is, they're all exactly the same, then they will produce a coherent pattern across the whole population, but it will only be one pattern. So the most Famous of these simulations done at the Santa Fe Institute is called the Boyds. I think it's by a guy called Greg. Um, but uh, 
in the voids, and you can spell it as voids, what he was trying to do was simulate the flocking of birds. So when heron take off from the lake and form those fantastic patterns as they weave through the sky, how are they doing that? I, I used to ask groups of managers when I was doing these workshops years ago, how do you think they're forming that pattern? And I knew the first person to answer that would say it's because they're following the, the leader. <laughs> no, it just happens to be a couple of uh, what, How you can model this uh, flocking, and you can just go and look it up on the computer and you'll see all the computer programs, you'll see all the flocking going on. Uh, is if the, each boy consists of three simple rules. And the rules are keep moving. Like the center. Sorry? Like the center. Maintain yes. Uh, Maintain go speed and avoid collisions. Yeah, keep a certain distance away from your nearest neighbors and tend toward the mass, the, the area of greatest mass. So there's these three things. Now, a number of writers on uh, complexity in organizations. Uh, including uh, Meg Wheatley, who uh, I used to know and sold hundreds of thousands of books, despite the fact that it's rubbish, uh, <laughs> probably because it's rubbish. Uh, in, uh, they claim that um, that means we can forget about all this planning and stuff. All we need to do is to set a few simple rules for people to follow in the organization and then we'll get what we want. So of course it loses the whole point because we're back into control, but now it's a simple matter. You can just set some rules. So tell everybody to be friendly and tell them to be collegial. Now go off and do it, of course, and then we'll have harmony and order and all that kind of stuff. And of course people love reading that because it means they can stop thinking. So um, what uh, is the other possibility here? Uh, and, and, and they lose sight of the fact that if, if people ever did all follow a few simple rules, they could only ever do one thing, which is flop. So, nothing creative could happen, and it would be the end of uh, human civilization. So, what's the alternative? Well, if you turn to other models, where the agents are heterogeneous. So, there's one very famous simulation called Tierra, and I can't remember the person's name, in which he starts a simulation off where the agents are <clears throat> the same. They're all, eight, but not simple anymore. They're 18 instructions long. <coughs> and they have to interact and reproduce themselves. But they interact by splicing half their instructions onto half the instructions of another agent. So it's a genetic algorithm. And uh, they also have to queue up in, in, uh, by age and face a grim reaper who chops them off after a certain period of time. And they make errors in copying themselves. And in a very short number of iterations, the models are, the, the agents become different to each other. They form groupings, short ones and long ones. And, and uh, symbiotic ones and predator prey ones and all sorts of and this is all com in computer modeling and you have to interpret uh, what this means but the key insight is that when the agents are heterogeneous they are capable of producing evolution without intention it's emergent 
And the thing about such models is, once the modeler has started it off, the modeler decides the first step or steps. After that, they just have to sit back and watch because they have no idea what's going to happen. And uh, I, I used to have quite a lot to do with uh, a physicist called uh, with Alan, who had worked with Ilya Prigogine, who was a great guy in the complexity field, and he was into this kind of modeling. Um, he, he called them evolutionary complex systems, and they were they were whole, <coughs> not agent based. But his models showed the same thing. He'd start them off, and before many iterations, they were doing all sorts of things he never expected. So um, he couldn't use them to predict, uh, but he could use them to get an intuition about the dynamics of, of the patterns of change. Um, and we used to joke about this because I, I'd say, so what you're the nearest you can come to modeling real phenomena is to have one of these evolutionary things. But the real phenomena will go off over there, and your model will go off over there, and they'll quickly lose contact with each other. And he would just chuckle and say, yes, yes, that's it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it never bothered him, because he was interested in what, what kind of patterns might it suggest to us as we talk about. So the insight then for organizations is all this idea of getting us to agree and to sing off the same hymn page or whatever it is, be on the same page, share the same values and do all that kind of stuff. If it had ever happened, human social evolution would have ceased altogether. So thank goodness we can't agree with each other and we carry on conflicting with each other because it's only through that that anything different happens. So we need to be thinking about the nature of conflict, power, anxiety, uh, greed, lust, uh, all the kind of uh, ordinary stuff that uh, we engage in in, in our organization. So I won't ask what you're making them back because you can do that in a smaller group. 